yeah, I grew up in a little council estate in East Wales, a place called Cumbran. It was a new town. And uh, yeah, my, I had an older brother and sister and then uh, a younger brother and sister. My mum and dad divorced quite, when I was quite young. So I, I grew up in the house with my mum and my, uh, my elder brother, elder sister. Uh, my elder brother, he's about 12 years older than me. He played Irish Exiles uh, with Excellent. Simon Gagan and gang back in the day. So uh, we, we had a sort of uh, Irish grandparents. So we had that, that gave us the idea, I suppose, when, when he realized that and he played, he went on a tour. I think it was, they toured the south of France, Baritz area. So uh, I grew up, we didn't have rugby in the primary school. I played it, it was all football and cricket, just, which is you sort of, uh, you're sort of constrained by the teachers that you have in primary school that, you know, whatever sport they were into, that's what they would teach you. And, and it's you know, mainly females. So, uh, you know, the whoever the, the sports mad sort of male teacher uh, happened to be, you, you sort of played, uh, you played that sport, you had the influence on that. So it was football and cricket, quick cricket back, uh, back in the day. All my mates sort of played football. We had a little red grass area, a little red gravel area, sort of just uh, not far from the house. And we'd be, we'd be football all sort of summer uh, or, or winter, summer, spring, and cricket would sort of... Uh, Cricket would sort of take handle then in in the summer when in the hotter months. But uh, and I used to play. You know, I was I wasn't great at any of it, but I used to play because all my mates used to play. So I, I got stuck in. And it was only when I was about eleven, I was bored on a Sunday. And my dad sort of grabbed me by the collar and said, "Come on, we're, we're going across to the the local the local rugby team, the local mini team, which was Cumbran Mini Rugby at the time." And my dad played uh, a bit of you know amateur rugby back in the day. He was a, my 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 sort of father's side were all sort of prop shaped. You're all five okay. foot ten and nineteen stone plus, <laughs> nineteen stone on light days. So uh, luckily, yeah, and I had nothing against the front row, but uh, you know they where they put their heads. Uh, you know, I, I'm just glad I put a few inches on later on in life, and I got to sit in the armchair behind them and get behind Adam Jones and gang and, and have a comfy ride behind them. But uh, yeah, we, yeah, I, it took me long. My first rugby game was up in the valleys in uh, just north of the other side of Newport. Uh, and I loved it right from right from the get go. It was more me, you know. It could be more physical, um, you know, with size fourteen feet that I've got now. Then I, I was never going to be a deft footballer, uh, I think. But it, yeah, I sort of took to it, and uh, yeah, I, I started playing for the school. Uh, Clantana was my school, which was Terry Cobner's old school, the old Welsh and British Lions sort of legend, Ponypool legend. And um, he was a sports master before he left before I got there. But it was the heritage was you know, was laid down with him. So, uh, you know, I was, I was keen as mustard playing for, for club and school. So it started, it started from there. So, but a late bloomer, so 11 years old. So I missed all the early rugby, uh, the old, the early mini rugby side. And I suppose, Ian, you mentioned you're having a brother that was 12 years older than you that played uh, rugby. And obviously he would have started at a young age, which are uh, obviously probably influenced by your father as well. So did you always sort of look up to him when he came home with sort of his rugby achievements and how he was getting on? Was it always talked around the sort of dinner table as well? And that make you sort of that bit jealous to try and Im- Im- emulate or his sort of success? Uh, well, no, not so much jealous. He, so he helped me out. Because uh, when I started, you know, he he was a late bloomer as well. So he was known as he was known as Stretch. We were we were like the tall, thin. My mother's side was the Stretch side, so we were the we were the tall ones. Uh, uh, dad's side was the squat side, but yeah, he was known as uh, Stretch, and I was always young Stretch. And you no, know, I used to watch him play. So uh, you know, I want to emulate him. And <clears throat> and he started putting a bit of weight on, uh, and wanted to go running. I was getting keen, so he'd take me out on sort of road runs sort of uh, in the evenings when he'd get home from work because it was still sort of semi-pro there. It was just before the game went pro. Uh, even though he had a, you know, he started having a paid sort of contract if you wanted, even if it was a little bit under the table at the time with Triorki and, and a bit with Newbridge. But he'd take me out running and then when I got a bit faster than running, a bit fitter, because I was a lot lighter, uh, then he took me to the weights gym at Cumbran Stadium and he'd give you a tune in on the weights then. So he knew he, he knew he could overtake me on the weights. But uh, no, I, I used to watch him play on a Saturday when we were playing mini rugby, which is a Sunday. I'd go and watch him play with my sister-in-law. And uh, yeah, we go across. I ended up being best man for him when I was 17. And uh, yeah, we, you know, I used to go to Newbridge initially and watch him. And, and then when he joined Triorki, just you know, towards the end of his career, that's when I started playing youth rugby. So that took up my Saturday. So uh, no, he, he was an inspiration, to be fair. My, my dad was good. He used to take me. You know, at a, <clears throat> we missed an age group at Cumbran around about under 14s 
Uh, and he used to take me that the, the next nearest decent team was Pontypool or Pontypool United, sorry. Uh, and he would take me, you know, he would he would drive me up or arrange lifts or arrange, you know, transport up there where after in the summer I'd ride my bike, you know, it was about a six mile ride. I'd ride my bike to preseason training, I'd ride my bike home. But the winter months, he would make sure I was supported as as well as I could by giving me lifts, getting me lifts and arranging things to to get me back and forth and, and to the games on a Sunday as well there. So yeah, you know, they both helped, you know, both inspirations in their own way. But my brother actually playing at that level was, uh, you know, he was brushing on the what would have been, well, he would have been pro. He retired in 95 when it went pro uh, with a dislocated knee. And uh, and then I came through there. My first season was uh, 96, 97 season. And I suppose, uh, Ian, in terms of growing up and watching an awful lot of rugby and you, your house is sort of steeped in rugby from what you're telling me, you do you grow up as sort of the heroes of the eighties, like the like the Garrett Edwards, uh, these types of guys? In terms of were they your sort of role models, your sort of inspirations? Those Welsh teams of the late eighties and were sort of figures out of those, especially playing and sort of the forwards as you played in terms of lock. Did you sort of looked up to, or did you admire the flares of the scrum halves and the fly halves and the 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 wizards of Welsh wingers that they had, or were they your sort of heroes? Or <coughs> do you find admiration to guys that sort of played up front, or was it all the flare bears that, that all that got all the scores and the the tries that you sort of tried to emulate when you were out playing with your friends? Uh, do you know what? a bit a bit of everything really? So I grew up, <coughs> and the video cassettes we had in the house, uh, my brother was a hundred one best tries, greatest tries, you know, volumes, mm. however many. But I used to watch that incessantly. And Max Boyce as well. I think my mum had a couple of Max Boyce tapes. So I quite encompassed the rugby sort of attitude, atmosphere, if you want, the camaraderie through through sort of Max Boyce, which I've managed to meet quite a few times uh, as I've been sort of you know, on my rugby journey, especially. And he still actually tends the pitch in, in Glenneath and he, he actually mows the lawns and sorts the clubhouse out and does things like that. So he's a good rugby man. But uh, no, I grew up watching under one greatest tries uh, and I was watching and, and then Mick the Munch Skinner's sort of big hits. And we had a guy called Mark Perigo. He played for the uh, for the Scarlets. That was a was you know he's a fireman, uh, but an incredible athlete, just completely off the wall, a big hitter, one of the first big hitters in Wales. Uh, and those are the guys I'd watch. But then I would watch, you know I'd, I'd watch the flair of the Gareth Edwards, the Phil Bennett. You know, he sadly departed uh, quite recently. Phil Phil Bennett, but you know, just absolute wizards uh, and the Barry Johns and the Yian Evanses as they come through. You know, great try scorers. Uh, and then, but then it was like the Emir Lewis's, the, the, the Taru, the the Bull, um, and and even the front row guys, the Polypool front row were infamous. And I I was born in Polypool, so the likes of Graham Price and Bobby Windsor and Charlie Faulkner, they were they were steeped in uh, you know in, in the in the game here. And and Graham Price, to be fair as well, was was a hell of an athlete. You know, I I think I, on 101 greatest tries, he scored a try against France uh, from about you know 50 meters. He sort of uh, he outpaced. I'm sure it was a century outpace to score in a corner. So even the props could, uh, even back in the day where it was a bit more brutal and a bit more stuck in the mud, you know, they they still had that turn of pace and and that bit about them. You know, I I loved you know Zinzan Brook was one of the first sort of uh, one of my first sort of not idols, but he you know when I when I saw you know the Lions and I think he, he dropped the goal from about forty odd meters and then I think it was Gavin Hastings he sort of uh, he cut in half for the tackle. I thought Christ, this this forward can drop goals and. The likes of John Eels and, and kick, you know, he can kick the ball, he can they can do everything. So it just it sort of gave me that sort of inspiration that, you know, just because you're a forward, it was uh, you know, that an old coach used to say, you know, we're we're piano movers, not piano players, you know, that's leave that to the backs. But people like that, and like of Scott Cornell just showed, you know, these you know, they can play and they weren't afraid to play. So uh, it, it gave you that thing that, you know, there's there's been quite a few uh front row forwards trapped. You know, outside arse trapped in front rows bodies. You know, Adam Jones was a, a typical example. You know, I I watched him practicing his drop goals on the training pitch numerous times, and and the skills he had was fantastic. He's just he was just trapped in that twenty odd stone body, but uh, he he had the skills to do it. So I think we grew up watching the likes of Phil Bennett and and, and the gang like that, and Jonathan Davis and Jiffy. You know, that those guys that could just absolutely turn it on, and it's just sort of part of that Welsh sort of flair. It's sort of uh, it's sort of encompassed in our upbringing. I think be a goal you know I'll, I'll i was offered a full-time contract uh and a and a welsh contract alongside it like a, a development contract uh to go full-time uh, and it was like a rugby apprenticeship they were putting on back there where you would cover nutrition you would cover you know aspects of sports science and 
at other bits. So we, I was doing that alongside this sort of rugby. But, uh, you know, I, I was very lucky that rugby sort of took off. We had 12 teams at that point. So it wasn't down to the regions as it is now. So the it, <clears throat> it wasn't saturated, if you want. You had uh, a lot of you know, a lot of players in 12 teams. Now you, you've got them concentrated in, in four regions in Wales. Uh, then 12 teams, you know, there was, you know, there was a lot of space, if you want, to sort of make your name. So I was a bit lucky. I think it's tougher for boys now with such a concentration of good players and, you know, in such a small amount of teams in the regions that the, the chances are a lot more few and far between than they were, uh, than they were for me back in the day. But, you know, we had to play a lot of rugby. It wasn't, about being in the gym as much. Uh, the academy boys now coming through, they, you know, they do a lot of gym work. They go, they do a lot of the off-field, uh, you know, the sideline stuff, if you want, the training. They, they get up to body shape really well. But uh, back then, you know, we didn't have that. I think I was 16 stone when I first started senior rugby. Uh, and I just played a lot of games, you know, and I sort of learned my trade by playing and learning the hard way at times when you when you go up to places like pont uh, uh, and some places, Triorkis up the up the valleys with us. It's uh, you know it can be a for a young kid and and actually going out to France playing out uh, against the the likes of Olivia Mill uh, and Abdul Benazi uh, and players like that out in uh, Clermont Ferrand and Argen and things like that. You you sort of you, you learn the hard way, but it sort of it schooled you it schooled you really well. So yeah, I was lucky in that fact that I got to play a lot of rugby and, and earn my stripes that way. Inquiries uh, after seeing my older brother uh, had played on a few tours with the with the Exiles. Uh, I made a contact. I think it was Phelan McGoughlin that uh, that he made contact with, um, and the O'Driscoll brothers were there at one point as well, and just had you know nice conversations and invite me across to to play. I think uh, in playing one of the games at Sunbury, uh, and I came across for a weekend. I think I just I hadn't long had my driving license and, and drove across and. You know, and they, they looked after me superbly well. They were they made me feel very welcome, and it was, you know, it was it was a you know I really enjoyed the the, the game as well. I really enjoyed the rugby, and then uh, I came across and the Irish XL plays. I uh, played Island A in Tillman Park, uh, and came across and played in that game, uh, and it was going it was going really well. And then I think someone from the Welsh Rugby Union sort of uh, got hold of me, and uh, and they. They sort of uh, you know, had had a big chat, and um, and soon after they I think they played me. I think Wales A were playing and uh, and got me involved basically, and and sort of sort of cap tied me if you want. They sort of uh, they sort of tied me, played in that game, and and tied me there. But it you know it, it, things happen for a reason like that. And and I remember having some you know great battles with the Irish second rows, the O'Connells and the O'Callaghan's and and all that over the years. Uh, who you know who were superb, superb for Ireland. So it was, it was lovely to sort of lock horns with them and, and what could have been, I guess, at one point. But, um, you know, I think it was, you know, I, I was brought up in Wales and the Irish thing was, was fantastic, but this was sort of my heritage and things like that. So I think um, it would have been a bit of a disservice if I, if I had come across, really. And I suppose, uh, Ian, you made your debut for uh, Wales against South Africa in 1998. And obviously, South Africa were the world uh, champions in 1995. And players like uh, Jus van der Vesthazen, uh, to, to mention a few, Bob, Bob Skinstad, uh, some iconic sort of uh, players in that sort of an era. And especially around the pack and sort of forwards as well, in terms of some of those players that won the Rugby World Cup in 95, they're sort of still revered uh, in, in terms of South African rugby there today, especially that pack. How was it like making your de- the position that I was in school, you know, where I was struggling at certain subjects? Uh, and we play, we play the video, we play the, you know, some of the clips from that game back in 98. And it's still to this day, Wales' worst ever loss. You know, it's still the biggest, the biggest points margin we've ever conceded. Um, basically, the message to the kids is, yeah, keep trying because you know, there's, there's sometimes you come unstuck in a big way. But you know, if you if you're willing to give up, you can just give up. But you know, if you if you keep having a go, you can turn it round. And and I think within within a year of that game, we almost beat South Africa in Wembley, and then within 18 months, we beat them at the at the Millennium Stadium before before it was fully built. Uh, and Gary Teichman, who was captain at that point, lost his captaincy. I think Nick Mallett lost his, uh, he lost the, the coach ship and he got sacked. Uh, and then I was lucky enough to play with Gary Teichman. He came to Newport uh, after that. I uh, got to play with Gary Teichman and Percy Montgomery and Andy Marinos and 
uh, Robbie Kempson come across for a bit as well, and and a few others, and uh, Bobby Skinstad. So I got to play with these legends, so not just play against them. And so and, and playing against Hugh Van der was incredible. And you know, uh, and sadly, you know, sadly he's not with us. And managed to play in one of his um, well, a charity game for him uh, in Alliance Park just after I retired uh, against uh, a team. I think it was a Mike Tindall and Jason Robinson fifteen, which were quite formidable. And Eustace was there as well. He was in a wheelchair, wheelchair bound at that point, and. Uh, and he passed away, you know, not long after that, you know, within the year of that. But it was nice to, you know, to, to do something for him because he was one of the, you know, when you, uh, these are these are guys that I used to look up to as a kid. I used to watch these players and, you know, I'd be in awe of these, you know, so especially some of these huge South Africans and playing against, I think it was Grano Otto was the second row at the time, who I think has passed away now as well. And, you know, they, they had some incredible players. And even when I watch it now, I watch the players, filing off at the end of the game when we're, we're showing the kids the scoreline and uh, and how it came unstuck for us and just still looking at some of these guys and you know I was lucky enough at the Ospreys to play with a few of the legends as well so uh, yeah you know it was a dream come true for me I sort of uh, I got to literally live that dream or come off a council estate in Combran with you know with that you know I had very little opportunities I guess it was a it, you had to sort of work quite hard for every opportunity you got and uh, and the next thing I'm playing alongside the likes of Gary Teichmans and the uh, the Marty Hollers and the Justin Marshalls and you know some of these sort of Percy Montgomerys, you know these uh, these legends of the game and and then I you know my first uh, you know I had a a young second row partner that came through the ranks and I got the partner for his first cap and that was a, a young Alan Wynne Jones back in 2006. So uh, you know I, I you know even homebound you know I got to play with. Uh, some fantastic players, you know, the Shane Howarth's this world. Is, there's too many to mention. There's, there's so many good players and superstars that I sort of played alongside. And I was just this little slow kid from Cumbran that, you know, wasn't the tallest second row, wasn't the biggest second row, wasn't the quickest, but still managed to sort of, uh, you know, be in the pool with some of these sort of legends. And obviously we mentioned about some of the legends from the Southern Hemisphere, but you would have come across some of the great uh, French forwards, the Benazis of uh, this world, uh, the the Magnas, uh, the Haranarda Keys uh, during the sort of day as well, in terms of the Palouse, Fabian Palouse, uh, these sort of guys in terms of with France and England were in their sort of pomp and you were go- the sort of the French teams that had the the Dominici's uh, in the background, the Bernard Salles, the, some of the great Intimax in, sort of like, in terms of that. Do you sort of revel in those occasions in uh, uh, in Wales and Millennium Park uh, in terms of w- welcoming sort of France and the sort of big uh, history that sort of came with those sort of ties with that? Was the Six Nations, did you always feel, did you always feel you could get up more for the England when England and France were sort of coming to town? Yeah, well, you know, the good, the good thing about the Six Nations stuff and the international stuff, you, you were up for every game. There was very few games that, you know, you might struggle against, you know, Italy were always a tough prospect, you know, because you knew you, you should beat them. But, you know, they, they were a physical side and to break down. But, you know, when, when I look back, you, you, I'd be playing against the likes of Palouse, the likes of Martin Johnson playing for England, Scott Murray that was playing for Scotland, that was a fantastic player, Doddy Weir. Uh, and, you know, and, uh, right, you're going to, you're going to, Right, I'm trying to think. Like his name's got out of my head. The great Munster Sekiro for not Paddy Johns, but Paddy Johns. Um, there was some, David Wallace. David Wallace would have been David Wallace. Yeah, no, who's a front jumper? Who's a front jumper? Munster man, front jumper. And his name's just gone out of my head. O'Callaghan. O'Callaghan. Before O'Callaghan. I'm just trying to think who it was before O'Callaghan. Um, okay. oh, not Paddy Johns. I'll, I'll think of it by the end of this. I'll think of it back to you. Uh, uh, you have the of that, but. You know, fantastic players. You know these these players. Yeah. I, you know, I was a young kid. Coming Neil Francis, with, Mick Galway, those type of players. Mick Galway, Mick Galway, Mick Galway. Yeah. There we go, Mick Galway. And, and you know, playing at Lansdowne Road, the old Lansdowne Road, uh, and against seas. You know, and it was like a cauldron. It was, uh, you know, the trains were clanking through, and the, you know the, the changing rooms were shaking, and you're know, going out. It was, uh, it, ah, it was, you know, it was, it was fantastic. France back in the day was a bit of a brutal place. It was. You know, the the mid to late nineties, it was still quite violent out there. It was quite, you know, there were it was gouging and there was, you know, ball bagging and you know, fish hooking. There was all sorts of stuff that was going on uh, uh in France at that point. And it was quite daunting as a young 20, 21 year old going out to places like this, facing the likes of Olivia Mill, who was a I think he was a Commonwealth shot putter, was he or a hammer thrower, something ridiculous, size 15, 16 feet, and you know, it, he had shovels for hands and he was, you know, they, they were 
they weren't used, they weren't pacifist hands as well. He'd be <laughs> throwing them about. It was it was a brutal game, but around about the two thousand mark, it um it cleaned up. It, you know, it just seemed to clean up overnight. Uh, and going out there, and you know, I should love going out to France then, although it was still an absolute battle, and it was it was a brutal place to go, you know, because they were so it was so intense. And but you you know, I love it when when a French team was playing well, you know, the national team and, and the club, you know, the, we went out to like Toulouse and Brive and you say Argen and some of these places and, and Racine and you know and Stade Francais and you know Baritz and they were incredible, you know, they were they, when they were they when they hit form, there was no better teams. You know, I just loved playing against them. But, you know, you think you'd have a good chance sometimes. But they would just, they would do things that were absolutely incredible. And it would, you know, it's almost like the, like the All Blacks can do. You know, they can just turn things on their head in a, in a moment of brilliance. And, you know, I just love it. I think it's just great for rugby when that, when a French team is playing, you know, really well. Uh, then it's just great for rugby. So I've been, you know, I've been sad for France over the years where they they haven't quite fulfilled their potential. And it, it's just nice to see them come back up there now. And again. It was daunting. You play against the Toulouse side uh, and a Claremont type side, and their backs were as big as their forwards. You were up against six foot three, six foot four backs. You know the Rougeries and Antimax. And, you know these guys were monsters. You know they were they were incredible. You you were going. You know I was going no nose to nose, and I think oh, he's a big lad and he's, he's a fullback. <laughs> and then, uh, I remember Shane coming up against Rougerie and Kevin Morgan, thinking, "Oh man, I'm in for an outing today," because he he wasn't just big. He was elusive and quick, and he had everything going for him. So it was a uh, yeah, it, it was always a special place to go, France, because you knew if you didn't absolutely hit form, if you you had to match the forwards first, and that was that was the challenge and a half. And then if you could just about match the forwards, you had to try and catch hold of the backs when they were when they were producing magic. So it was yeah, it was a special place, special place to go. And you know, again, tough at the early days. It was a it was getting over the brutality and the the, the thuggery, if you want. And then in the you know as it went through the millennium, then into the two thousands, it was just you know, you were able to keep up with fantastic play and, and, and amazing flair, which is what the Welsh team used to base themselves in the 70s and how we came through was playing off that flair, you know, and, and you know, the Gerald Edwards, the Gerald Davises and to the Phil Bennett's, Barry Johns and Gareth Edwards's and all that, and Fenwick's and the Gravels, you know, they were the incredible players. Uh, Ian, before I start to finish up, I want to touch on one of your teammates now in the Wales sort of, sort of jersey that you would have played with initially uh, on in your career. And I've, unfortunately, he's not a forward, but he's a he, he's a back, he's a, a fly half. And why I called him dubbed up when I saw him here in Ireland watching the Six Nations as a, as a child, I called him the, the machine, uh, Neil Jenkins. Because it was almost like a machine, like in terms of any penalty within forty yards, within any sort of radar, it was almost like he was in machine mode the whole sort of thing. Didn't sort of give across that sort of personality and almost like that serious sort of complexion. What was Neil Jenkins like? As as a, what we saw on the rugby field, was he very much uh, like that uh, off the field? He always struck me as sort of. Um, an architectural type of guy, a studious type of guy uh, in terms of he almost a self-perfectionist that everything would have to be to his standard. And if it didn't meet his standards, then uh, everything would have to stop on, and get up to his sort of standard as sort of such. Uh, you know, he, no, he's Jinx, uh, as we sort of know, we know him as Jinx. And uh, he was a clean off bloke, right? He was bonkers, right? He's a okay, he, he completely different soul than what I oh, thought he was. So, completely different, yeah. Yeah, like you, you're describing Dan Bigger a little bit there. Biggs is, you know, Biggs is pretty much like that. He's, you know, he's very demanding at, at times. I think Jinx was just, you know, he was just, he's a, he's a great guy as well. He's a good bloke, and the work he does now, like he's one of those, that's, you know, like the Ray Gravels. He remembers boys' names, and he, you know, even the youngsters coming through. You know, he's got that real ability to, to really sort of remember boys and, and have that little, you know, have time for people. You know, it's quite, you know, when when you've been to the heights he has, you know, that's a that's a big, you know, the, the humility he has is is incredible. But you know, I, I've seen him; he's a fiery bugger, and off, you know, and off the pitch, we've had some fun on on trips when I was at Ponapreeth. The first year I was at Ponapreeth with him, uh, and I like to Dale McIntosh uh, uh, and the gang there, and. Yeah, he, he could be clean off when he wanted to. So he'd, uh, yeah, I think his I think his father they had some sort of a scrapyard business, uh, just by Ponapri there, and 
yeah, he, he was this fiery ginger kid, and you know, uh, and you know when he had a beer and he liked the beer, he was uh, he was good fun, you know, he was he was good crack with it, and his his Mrs. Cath was just as crazy as him as well on the beers. She sort of she would meet him with craziness, uh, but you know, just a top top guy. And again, when we went to a lean spell in the eighties, you know, when we won games eighties and nineties. It, it was Neil, it was Jinx that was the catalyst for that. And, you know, the famous win we had in Wembley where Scott Gibbs scored that try and Scott Quinnell burst through. You know, the, the only reason we were in touch with England that day is because Jinx just kept kept us in touch with his goal kicking. And, you know, contextually in a game, if you just go, if you go 15, 20 points behind, especially when you're playing a French, a French type team, then they just do everything. They just, they can just play. They can just, the game changes for them. They can open it right up. So to have someone like Jinx that could just keep you in touch, just keep those penalties kicking, you know, just going over from 40, 50 metres was just huge for Wales. It was, you know, we won a lot of games that we shouldn't have won maybe or we would have been out of touch with if it wasn't for if it wasn't for him. I don't know what his final title, he was way over a 1,000, wasn't he? His final mm-hmm. total, which is uh, which is incredible in a, in a Welsh team that didn't play that well. You know, we never really sort of, we never really connected. We never really gelled uh, through that. So we had some superstars, you know, the, the Scott Gibbses, the Rob Howleys, and the Scott Cornells, and we had some of these superstars there, but we never really connected as a team. We never really fulfilled potential there. But you know, Neil Jenkins just kept us going and and kept those points going over. So, but you know, an absolute top bloke, and yeah, yeah, your perception. It's funny you get a perception of someone from seeing on the pitch, but he was a, he was certainly a character. He was certainly a character off it, and uh, yeah, many a good night. Out with him and the Pony Breathe boys uh, just after the Battle of Breathe. Funny enough, I joined them after they had that titanic sort of fight, if you want. It was uh, it was the first Welsh team that went out to France in the 90s that uh, that actually gave as good as they got, you know, and that was after the game as well in Bartuzak, I think. Yeah. Uh, and I joined them a year later. We flew out to Montpellier in Newport. They flew out to Breathe. We flew back and they were under hotel arrest for a couple of days. And uh, <laughs> yeah, they're. Uh, they were they were a good bunch, the Ponty boys, and uh, you know I, I enjoyed my couple of years up there, but uh, and especially with the likes of uh, likes of Jinx, Neil Jenkins, and Dale McIntosh and Steele Lewis and that gang. Yeah, and finally, Ian, before I let you go, I just want to touch on one Irish player that you would have came across early on in your career, and I suppose he was Ireland's first uh, in the late nineties, Ireland's first uh, big sort of world rugby superstar. He got voted rugby player, world player of the year early on. One of the first guys ever to receive that award, Keith Wood. When you were in the Wales sort of dressing room and you were sort of planning uh, against Ireland, would you always sort of design time to try and stifle Wood's influence? Because Wood was the ability that he bring Ireland from the claws of defeat many a time to bring them back into games and win games that they shouldn't have and especially in terms of line outs or out near the near the try line or scrums near the try line Wood was all almost an unstoppable force yeah you know he was a, a big character of the game as well yeah I only played against him a few times but yeah big character larger than life and uh yeah he was he was so do you know what but um my abiding memory of Wood of Woodsy when we, we played them in Wembley just before the Millennium Stadium was built. Uh and, and Ireland beat us that day. And I remember we were all like we were having a few drinks together, we we're all in the same sort of it must have been the after dinner. Uh, and the, the wives were sort of invited into it. The wives were it was like a bit more of an informal one. Uh, and then Woodsy, I think he's uh, he, he I just remember him saying to a few of the Irish boys, quick, come on, we've got to go. Let's get out of here quickly in his in his dulcet Irish tone. Uh, and I'm I'm looking to see why. And he said, quick, because uh Scott Cornell's missus, Nick and Nicola. I think Nicola, Scott Cornell's missus is on the rampage. She's had a few beers and she's gonna be, she's gonna be giving us hell. And she's a, she's a lovely girl, uh, but she'd be picking him up and she, oh, she'd be playing hell with him. And he's like, quick, and just to see Keith Wood, right, go nose to nose with, you know, my first cap in South Africa. They, I think he played, they played the week before Ireland played South Africa the week before and gave them a really good game. It was a real tight game, uh, and they just lost out in the end. And you know, he he was the catalyst for that. Uh, and then, you know, obviously we lost by, you know, what we did. But then seeing him in, you know, after the game in Wembley and uh, and running scared from Scott Quinnell's missus, <laughs> his wife, 